I want to deal now with the issue of climate change. Here is a conservation problem for which we don't have a solution yet, but still it's very important. Look at the past 150 years of climate records from Norelia on the top graph. Temperature has been increasing steadily as time went on. This is average annual temperature over the last century and a half. On the bottom, for comparison, I've given you Colombo. Even Colombo is warming, but Norelia has warmed at almost twice the global average. And I'm sure Horton Plains, uh, Norelia is a good proxy for Horton Plains, and the situation in the Horton Plains is probably even worse. We don't have climate records for that period from the Horton Plains. And look at rainfall. Rainfall has been declining precipitously in Norelia over this past period. And if you remember from your school geography days what makes a dry zone, wet zone, and arid zone, you can see that Norelia is now in the dry zone. That's a shocking thing. The fact is that Norelia receives rainfall at regular intervals, unlike in most of the dry zone where you just get the northeast monsoon. So it's still looking reasonably green, but the fact is it's getting, on, in some years, half as much water as it got 150 years ago. So this is going to have huge impacts on the vegetation, naturally. And then if you plot temperature against rainfall, you'll see an even more dramatic decline. So we know that as the temperature increases, we are going to see a decline in rainfall in the highlands. In the lowlands, not so dramatic. So global warming is going to have huge, incalculable consequences for fragile, sensitive habitats like the Horton Plains. But it can also have good consequences. So one of those good consequences, I think it's a good consequence, is that now there's hardly any periods of frost on the Horton Plains. When I was a kid and I used to go there to trout fish with my dad in the 1960s, Frosts were very common. Sometimes by 7, 8 at night you get a ground frost. Now it's unthinkable to have a ground frost, uh, except on a very cold early morning. And as a result of there being fewer frost, frosty nights, we've had rhododendrons slowly colonizing the grasslands. Because the grasses are tolerant of frost, most flowering plant species are not. But now rhododendrons have started colonizing the grasslands. So this will probably end up by the time my grandchildren are my age. I don't have any grandchildren yet, but the day will come, I'm sure. Um, the, by the time, 60 years from now, I suspect these trees will change the landscape of the Horton Plains where we don't see a grassland anymore. We are seeing a forest. Um, that process has begun in the last 20 years or so, and this natural transformation is now taking place. So it's an exciting time. When you go there, you can see the last, we might be the last generation to actually enjoy the grassland because now it's been taken over by rhododendrons, which are the pioneer species for the grasslands. So here's succession. That was the story I started telling you earlier, happening all over again. And as these rhododendrons crop up, they provide perches for frugivorous birds. Fruit-eating birds don't like grass and they don't usually go and perch on the ground. They need a place on which to sit. And so now, into the forest, we have, for example, white eyes coming and nectaring on plants, and, uh, and in any case, these physically form a perch on which frugivorous birds can come and, and perch. And the advantage then is that those birds, having eaten fruit in the forest, come and defecate on the tree, or near the tree, and allow a new succession to take place in the shade of the rhododendron because the rhododendron is now suppressing the grass by providing shade and in the shade it gives a chance for those seeds dispersed from the forest as a result of these perches being available to grow under the rhododendron tree. So providing birds with perches like this is very important. I believe the technical term for birds of this, uh, the behavior of birds of this kind the technical term is sit and shit. Um, not altogether polite because birds don't, frugivorous birds don't usually do it while they're flying. 
And you often see articles in the newspapers and you yourselves will be concerned about European plants like this, again invasive plants that grow in the Horton Plains. We've tried in the past to uproot these and throw them away, but actually uprooting plants like this as a conservation intervention is a waste of time and effort because the seeds from these plants are viable in the ground for periods of up to 30 years. So even if you uproot them, you still have the problem cropping up. What's the solution? Shade. So uprooting the plant is of no point, but if we shade the plant, it has no chance of survival because all these alien species need to have direct sunlight. Besides which, just like those alien grasses benefit the samba, we have these alien species benefiting lizards like the endemic Calotes nigrilabris that you find on Horton Plains because the profuse flowers of this alien species, Ulex, also known as gorse, attract insects and the lizards come to feed on the insects. So even though the, the alien species is not a good thing, it does have benefits, just like the alien grasses have for the sample. And while we're on the subject of aliens, there's also the rainbow trout introduced to the Horton Plains in the 1880s. Funnily enough, we protect these horrible animals. They're very destructive. Rainbow trout are one of the most destructive fishes in the world. This is a species introduced from California, and I have no idea why it should be allowed to persist in a fragile ecosystem like the Horton Plains. Especially considering that in addition to dragonfly and damselfly larvae, these trout are feeding on four endemic species of crustaceans, two of which are found only in the Horton Plains, nowhere else in the world. So all these four species, the shrimp the two, and the three crabs, uh, are endemic genera and endemic species. They're very valuable and need conservation attention. And I think the time has come when we need to rethink as a conservation objective the wisdom of having trout on the Horton Plains. But like in the case of the lizard, like in the case of samba, even trout have their uses because we've got an extraordinarily big otter population that feeds on the trout now. So every conservation intervention you make to keep those evolutionary processes going has a consequence that is distasteful. We don't want fewer samba. We don't want fewer lizards. We don't want fewer otters. And at the same time, we want mm. conservation. And if you're going that far, why not go all the way? Why not reintroduce elephants to the Horton Plains? We know that up till the 1890s, in the time of botanists like Trimmon and ecologists like Heckel, they recorded large herds of elephants in the Horton Plains. Uh, this is a photograph from the Nilgiris where still in the highland grasslands you get elephants persisting. And if we go that far, uh, this means that we need to establish uh, areas of forest that are a bit more connected than today, but I'll get to that. Why not go all the way and reintroduce the gaur? We know that gaur were common in Sri Lanka's highlands until a few centuries ago. We don't know exactly why they disappeared, but the vast number of place names that are named for the Gaur, Gaura Thanna, Gaura Elia, Gaura Gama, all over the highlands, suggest that these were common animals associated with human habitations at the time. Finally, as part of my conservation interventions, I want to get to the if, issue of canopy dieback. This is something that you've probably heard of or very likely seen when you visited the Horton Plains. We see in the highlands large numbers of trees. This is a Calophyllum walkeri, endemic species of tree that grows only in the Sri Lankan highlands, nowhere else in the world, and it's dead. This tree is probably four or 500 years old. It's tragic that it died in our generation, out of the dozens of generations it has survived. And this phenomenon where acres of trees suddenly curl up their toes and die was first observed in the 1970s. For 30 years, we did no research to try and find out what was causing it. Finally, in the late 1990s, people started taking an interest and trying to find out what was happening. It was only last year that finally some research showed what might be the culprit. But in the meantime, 
about a thousand acres of the Horton Plains. And you know the Horton Plains is a very small area, 31 square kilometers. A thousand acres of the Horton Plains is already dead. When you look at the canopy, it's this horrible bare branches of dead trees. And the fact of the matter seems to be that the mist on which these forests depend is largely the culprit. Uh, a study done by Professor E. R. N. Gunnar Wadana of the uh, Peradeniya University found in 1998 that mist water was extremely acid. A pH of 3.9, if you expose a leaf of almost any tree to that kind of acid rain on a persistent basis, it will wither and die. So the trees stop photosynthesizing when their leaves fall off. Even the rainwater is very acid. And last year, Professor Yapa from Sabargamo University did this beautiful study in which he studied one of the canopy species of trees that is affected, Syzygium rotundifolium. It's an endemic uh, montane species of Verilu. And he found an amazing thing. The lead content of the soil around these trees was 106 parts per million. That is a lethal load of lead. He also found high levels of cadmium. These are two heavy metals very closely associated with industrial pollution. The leaves of these species that were dying had lead content of more than four parts per million. Again, highly toxic. And he did a study for a whole bunch of saplings of syzygium and found that once the lead content exceeds 60 parts per million in the soil, the plants die. Now with 60 parts per million being the lethal dose, it's astonishing that there are areas of the Horton Plains which have got more than 100 parts per million. The ground is poisoning the trees. So where does the toxin come from? I told you earlier that these plants are specially adapted to extract water from the mist. They don't just extract water, they also extract nutrients from the mist. They extract magnesium, calcium, sulfur, nitrogen. So when we put other substances into the mist water through industrial effluents, the plants are ready to absorb those too. They take the poison with the food, and as a result of that, they die. The way the mist works in transferring these toxins to the plants is rather the way a nasal inhaler, you know, when you've got a congested nose, they give you a spray. Rather like that, because a spray with tiny droplets, if you remember your O-level mathematics, you realize that tiny droplets have a much greater surface area than big droplets compared to their volume. And so just like uh, an inhaler or a nebulizer you might use for asthma, the delivery of these fine sprays, like mist, they're very good things because they've got a large surface area. They're very good at delivering the contents of the, the droplet to the organism. As a result of this, they also deliver all the bad things. But it's not just uh, industrial Affluent. We don't know where this effluent is coming from. It might be coming from India. It might be coming from China. We know that the lead is not coming from Sri Lanka because we stopped using lead in petrol in 2003, for which you can thank me because I was in the Ministry of Environment at the time and we fought very hard with the CPC to get... We were one of the last countries in the world to get lead out of petrol. And that happened 13 years ago. So uh, we've, we're probably getting these coming with clouds and wind from India, from China, who knows? We need to do some research to find out. You've all probably seen these beautiful beard lichens that grow on uh, the trees on Horton Plains. But if you've been there recently, you'll see that there's no more beard lichens along the footpaths or along the roads. You've got to go deep into the forest to find them. And the reason for this is all the carbon dioxide we are emitting from the cars, diesel and petrol powered cars that are driving up to the Horton Plains, but not just the cars. 
us. On average, 800 people a day walk the world's end trail. And the breath, the carbon dioxide we are exhaling, kills these lichens. It is a surprising thing that even such a small human impact can have such a profound effect on a sensitive ecosystem like this. So we have a huge job ahead of us to inform the public about what's going on. Disappointingly, when we've tried to do this, we've done it very badly. About 10 years ago, during the ADB project that spent more than 3 billion rupees of money that was loaned for, to Sri Lanka, they actually hired a Canadian consultant, a lady who was paid pretty much $1,000 a day to come and do the signage in Horton Plains. It's a disgrace. If you go in the visitor center, it is a mine of misinformation. There's this big placard, Horton Plains, Horton Plains, what's the photograph? St. Clair Falls in Talavakali. Here we have a big story about Major Thomas Rogers who killed lots of elephants. No relation to Horton Plains whatsoever. The photograph they put in, Major Thomas Rogers actually died before the invention of commercial photography. So there can't be a photograph of him, full stop. So they put a photograph of Ernst Haeckel, a wonderful, clever ecologist and a great friend and supporter of Charles Darwin. There's dozens of examples like this. And then what about these horrible buildings that we put? I mean, does this pristine landscape deserve this kind of slum? It doesn't. But we need to convince the authorities that this has to be changed. Before I conclude, I just want to run you by one final idea. That is that the Horton Plains is an island. It's a small island, 31 square kilometers. And we know that if an island of montane forest exists, surrounded by land that has been deforested, the cloud level goes up by another 100 meters, 300 feet. So we found that when it was converted to grassland, the cloud level would have gone up by 100 meters. Now, as a result of the surrounding deforestation, the cloud level goes up yet about another 100 meters. Less cloud cover for the trees, and the whole idea of a cloud forest is lost when the plants can't extract water from the mist. So the challenge for the next generation is how to establish connectivity. All this white stuff is tea. How do we connect parks like the Horton Plains with neighboring plants, with parks? Haggala, just there. Pedro, just there. Then we have uh, Great Western, and so on. And we need to establish connectivity across these. The thing to remember is that Sri Lanka is developing very rapidly. We don't realize it. We all complain about the rate of development. But we've had very rapid development. Average per capita GDP in Sri Lanka is now $3,800 a year. More than double that of India. Three times that of Kenya, countries with whom we compete economically. We are streets ahead. And a consequence of that in the future, as we develop more and more, is that this model of peasant farming that we operate today is going to disappear. It has disappeared in every other country that's reached a GDP of about $6,000 per capita. And when that disappears, we are suddenly going to wake up and say, wow, we've got money, but we don't have nature anymore. This has happened in other countries. Costa Rica and Puerto Rico both went down to 10% forest cover. In Sri Lanka now, we have more than 25% forest cover. So we should be pleased about that. But we don't want to get into their situation because when they, when they became prosperous countries, they had already lost their forest. And so they had to start this huge program to reforest their countries. But as I told you earlier, the reforestation process in Horton Plains is very, very slow. So 20 years ago, I put my money where my mouth is and bought this little red piece of land there, quite close to Horton Plains, a tea estate, and decided it would have earlier been a cloud forest until the British cut it down and turned it into tea, and decided that I'm going to try an experiment. I'm embarrassed to say this because now I work for the tea industry, but I pulled out all the tea, and we established shade trees like this. I'm glad to say that the man who started this project, Dinesh Gabadage, is in the audience today, uh, 20 years ago. He was a pioneer in this site. He pulled out the, the, the tea and started putting up shade. And in the shade 
of those trees, we developed a nursery and from seed and from vegetative propagation, uh, developed tens of thousands of young native montane forest plants. And with a small team of workers, we planted these tens of thousands of plants. This is a Schumacheria, an endemic genus and species of uh, plant. We planted these out in the forest. And as you can see from these photographs, the forest is now regenerating 20 years later. We've got native syzygium, tree ferns, and so on. But of course, still, those nasty Mexican eupatoriums are there, because when the shade comes up, they will disappear. And that's an idea of the, the gross landscape of the area today. We've published a lot of science from this property, uh, including papers on the way in which animals are now coming in, including amphibians and so on. But the fact of the matter is that it's going to be a very long time before we see this. I'm going to be an old man before we have any conclusion to this project. So I'm going to quickly recap, because I've got one minute left. Uh, you need to decide, do we make the interventions that I described? We've got a, a long list. Because you are like the family of the patient in intensive care. We've got the conservation biologists, people like myself and others in this room, I know, who are coming up with the science that helps inform these decisions. But in each decision, as I told you, there is a choice. And that choice needs to be made by us, the stakeholders, as collectively. And we've got the research people who are providing the technology. But unless all three of these constituencies get together and make collective, informed decisions, the result is going to be a not very good one. That's my message. Thank you very much. The, the question is that we're not allowed to uh, we're not allowed to fish for trout in Horton Plains. That's true. I think we should be because this is a species we don't want to see there, and we should encourage it. I think we, we had a recent census, and there are about 600 adult trout in Belluloe in Horton Plains, and of course several times at many juveniles. So I think eradicating the trout, or at least controlling their population through fishing is probably a good thing, but that's one of the interventions that we have to decide as, as conservation enthusiasts to take. The public has to decide. So, uh, this list, the uh, first being five, is uh, something I realized before. But uh, the soil acidity and the acidity in the, uh, the environment around the California organisms has been caused in the depths of the pre the site here, the lizard there, Cocodix, Cocodix, and uh, also some of the amphibians. And uh, the effect you mentioned on the, the lichens that uh, grow on the trees, Outside, I think to think that there is another player here, and that is actually over critical spot that's from the development of the Western problem. We talked this stuff up. Uh, I'm not uh, denying that uh, France boundary hallucinations are already looking at that seriously, and that's a very interesting uh, case to take up, which we should just consider. Uh, doing it the modern days because that opened the door to the potential cause, which could put a lot of pressure on the big polluters all over the planet. But we could be spearheaded by taking our government to court over the lack of uh, uh, protection of the hot plate, which is essential for rising to stew to take it, first of all. Th thank you. It's a very useful observation. Thank you. fascinating lecture. In fact, I found it really informative about uh, a fragile ecosystem that all of us are familiar with, but uh, unfamiliar with the consequences of uh, human actions and how they impact the plane. Uh, I found it very educational, very informative, and also very current in the scientific knowledge that we have pulled together uh, to give this uh, 
uh, talk today. Uh, I'm uh, happy that he accepted this invitation to come and speak because uh, when we contacted him, he was not in the country and he was only coming back a few days before uh, today. But uh, we made arrangements with him uh, through emails and other means of communication and I'm glad that he made it today uh, to give this talk and I, I hope that he will uh, come uh, to WMPS in the future as well to speak on uh, other areas of expertise because uh, Rohan is one of the most uh, published uh, scientists in the natural sciences in this country um, and he does not spend uh, all his time in this country anymore so we we'll have to catch him whenever he is available. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the NTV Nations Trust Bank uh, who have supported us uh, and uh, the DBU for hosting us here this venue. Also, uh, Pro image uh, for and video for equipment that they have supplied and uh, Sarava advertising uh, for the promotional material and Dilma Tea for the tea service as well as the uh, uh, complimentary uh, yes, yes. And I also like to mention that uh, we have an SDM coming up uh, on the 10th, which is Saturday evening. And uh, our forum required is 50, so uh, I'm just uh, making a piece to the members here. Uh, if you can try and make it so that we have the forum, uh, because if you don't have the forum, uh, that SPM goal uh, is postponed by another two weeks. And uh, a couple of other announcements. There, there is also the Rohan's book on the Horton Plains, uh, which is uh, going to be retailed here uh, for 5,000 rupees, which uh, the proceeds of which go to the WMPS, as well as uh, uh, some posters on Horton Plains, which are available for, for 100 rupees. And also membership application forms for those who are interested in joining the WMPS. Thank you very much once again, Rohan, for an excellent talk.